You know, during my life, I've had a lot of experiences, good, bad, and otherwise. I've been homeless. That's popular today. <laughs> I was a firefighter. I was an arborist. That's a guy that climbs trees. I was a motivational speaker and an artist and a business owner. You do not get rich writing books, <laughs> believe me. So what I've decided to do is instead of writing books and trying to sell them and put money in my pocket, if you buy one of my books, you make the check out to the church here. Uh, but you have to promise if you buy one of my books to get back to me and tell me what you thought about it. Now, if you didn't like the book, I'm going to throw that away, you know. <laughs> <laughs> if you like the book, I'll keep it. You know, God told Pastor Steve some time ago that his shift was not over in spreading the gospel. I remember that, and so I thought to myself, well, when is my shift going to be over? You know, so now I speak as many groups as I can as often as possible because my shift isn't over either. The message that was given to us in this book right here is the message we're going to talk about today. This is a heavy book, uh, but it's full of... Uh, a, a famous man said, a famous president said, everything we need to know to make the world go right is in this book. And so that's what we're going to talk about. You know, I'm not comparing myself to Pastor Steve, but I think all of us here have a mission. They hung my Savior and your Savior on the cross and gave him a crown of thorns. Three days later, on Sunday, he rose from the tomb and has changed the world as no other person who ever lived has changed the world. So I decided if they could put a crown of thorns on my Savior, the least I could do would be a thorn in the devil's side. That's what I am. That's why I'm here today, to be that thorn. When Shauna asked me to do today's Bible study, my first thought was, of course, just what exactly am I going to speak about? I'm not a pastor. I'm a lay, lay minister, whatever that means. What am I going to do? What am I going to say? Where am I going to go? Then I heard someone talking about the legacy that we leave behind. Every one of us here will leave a legacy behind, good, bad, or otherwise. So the concept seemed to take hold of my brain and, and led me to the two most important commandments the Lord has given us, and she'll put those up on the screen. Hello, there they are. Of all the commandments which the Lord has given us, the most important are, love the Lord as your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. We know that. The hard part of it comes in the second part of the commandment, which is, Love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's Mark 12, 30, 31. So today, before we start to celebrate the resurrection, I'd like to talk to you about those two great commandments and the legacy that each one of us will leave behind when they leave this earth, you leave this earth, I leave this earth, to spend eternity with Jesus. You know, the definition of a legacy is something that you leave behind. It often refers to money that's will to somebody, but the word legacy has a far broader, broader implications than what's left monetarily. Many of the poorest people in the world have left great legacies. I'm sure all of us want to leave some kind of legacy when we die. But if you did not change anything you were doing in your life right now, think about this. What would your legacy be? If you did not change anything you're doing in your life right now, what would your legacy be? What kind of leg legacy would you leave? There's a book I think you should read. It's called In Order to Live. It was recently published. It was about a 13-year-old girl who escaped from North Korea through China and then to South Korea. I don't know if anybody here has read the book. Uh, it'll, it'll take your breath away. The months that it took her was a harrowing experience with her and her mother trying to get out of North Korea, China, and get to South Korea. As she was stretching through the bitter cold at night, the last night before she got into South Korea, 
she said to herself, am I going to die out here and nobody, no one will know who I am or care who I am? You know, I thought, found those thoughts rather interesting. Basically, she felt that she was going to be a non-entity. No one would know who she was or care who she was or would be interested in even finding out who she was. And that she thought her body would be discarded like she had seen so many other bodies discarded in her country. Simply thrown into the gutter. It would be like she never existed. Even though she did not express her concern of leaving a, a legacy, this really is what she was concerned about, wasn't it? She would have no legacy. There's an interesting story about a guy by the name of Tug McGraw, who was a superb baseball pitcher back in the 60s. Has anybody heard of that name? I don't know anything about baseball. But uh, some enthusiasts like you guys may remember him, but do you, do you remember the phrase he said? His phrase was, you got to believe. In 2003, at the age of 59, the doctors discovered a brain tumor, and he was told that he had three weeks to live. He lived nine months and devoted his time back still on this earth to his family in attempting to find a cure for cancer. That's one of the things that Tug McGraw is remembered for. That's his legacy. So he spent the last nine months of his life doing whatever he could to help mankind. But there's another part of his legacy that was just as important as that, and maybe more so. Tug had a wife and children at the time, but he also had a son that he had previously ignored for many years. The son was not told by his mother that his father was this famous baseball player. But one day the son, named Tim, found his birth certificate and made the shocking discovery. At that time, his name was Tim Trimble. When Tim found the birth certificate, he changed his name to Tim McGraw. Those of you who follow country music, and I know you do, will recognize the name. Tim found his father in, while he was in his teens, and nothing really happened. I mean, it wasn't right. But as the teenager got older, he decided that he needed to work hard toward his father and him getting a big relationship. See, he didn't give up. As an adult, he once made a connection with his father, Tug, and the relationship blossomed. Ask yourself this question. Do you have relationships with your children, your grandchildren, or people in your life that you've kind of moved aside and said, I, I don't want to have this relationship? Well, guess what? That might be, if you chased after it, it might be one of the most important relationships you could ever have. As an adult, <clears throat> Tim made connections with, us, with his father, and when the news came that his father had a short time to live, their relationship became even stronger. So Tim Tug McGraw died, believe it or not, in his son's house in Nashville, Tennessee. In 2004, the year of Tim Tug McGraw's death, Tim wrote a song called Live Like You Are Dying. It was on the top of the charts for 10 weeks breaking a record that had stood for 30 years and was named a top country song of the year by Billboard magazine. It was a story of about a man who was dying and the decision of how he would live with the time he had left. Tug McGraw left a legacy trying to find a cure for cancer, which he obviously didn't do. But think of the restoration of his relationship with his son that he'd had ignored for so many years. I think that was an even greater legacy. Ask you, are you thinking very carefully about what I'm going to ask you? If doctors told you that you only had a short time to live, if they told you that today, would it make a difference? Would it make a difference when you look back and say, who can I do that is my neighbor that I can help? Would you do that? If a doctor told you that it, you know, why would we change priorities? 
Are there relationships out there that you might want to restore? No matter what age you are, remember this. The opportunity to leave a legacy that we want to leave is one day closer today than it was yesterday. Why do we wait until something tragic happens before we see the urgency to make change? Thought-provoking? We all know the most important decision in our lives is the decision to accept what Jesus did for us on the cross. The decision on what our legacy will be might be one that ranks rather high in the decisions we make in our life. There's a story in Matthew 19 about the young rich man who we assume he was an upstanding citizen, but he asked Jesus, what must I do to have eternal life? Jesus told him, well, you don't murder people, you don't commit adultery, you don't steal, you honor your parents, and so on and so on. But he also put in there, love your neighbor as yourself. Remember that, love your neighbor as yourself. The man replied that he had obeyed all the commandments. And he asked, what else must I do? Jesus told him, sell all your possessions, give the money to the poor, and then you would have treasure in heaven. The rich man was not willing to do that. He loved his wealth too much to give it away. Until he was willing to give up that finan and make that financial sac sacrifice, he could not have the one thing that he wanted most, which was Jesus. So what do you think this man's legacy was? Where was his heart? I think his heart was covered with dollar signs. No, I don't think Jesus wants us to go home and sell all of our possessions, but I think he wants us to consider where our heart is. We have a two-fold purpose in life based on the two most important commandments that we've been given. And neither one of these commandments involves anything about our possessions that we accumulate in our lives, the awards we win, the notoriety that we gain, the fame, the fortune, and all of that. I want to repeat these two important commandments that we've been given. Number one, can we get that up? <laughs> Here we go. Here's the two most important commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. That's the first part of it. The second part of it is Love your neighbor as yourself. She didn't quite get that up there, but that's all right. Love your neighbor as yourself. There are no commandments greater than these. To me, loving your neighbor and yourself means loving all the people that God puts in your way in your life. You know, we can recite these two most important commandments, but... We know them in our mind, but in our daily living, are we always using them in our actions? Knowing is the easy part. Acting on them is something difficult. The rich man was unwilling to sell his possessions and give his, poor, his, his wealth to the poor. He knew the truth, but he could not put it in practice. He loved his possessions more than he loved God. When we realize in our hearts who Jesus really was and what he offered us, there's no cost that we should be unwilling to pay. I'm going to ask you a question. You don't have to raise your hands. If today somebody came to you from the government or whatever, not the government particularly, and said, if you don't forsake Jesus, I'm going to kill you. Huh? Ask yourself, what would you do? I'm not going to answer that. I know what I would do. I would say you're going to use a 38 or a 45. <laughs> Wouldn't bother me a bit. Because <sighs> this man's possessions was more than he loved God. When we realize in our hearts who Jesus really is and what he offers, there is no cost that we shouldn't pay. Jesus provided us with an example of his perfect legacy. He did not leave a legacy of money. He left a legacy, of, he had no legacy of power, popularity, or anything. He left a legacy of he loved God the Father completely. He prayed to God the Father for direction. He submitted his, 
himself to the will of God, his the Father, and he knew the scriptures. And Jesus loved us so completely that he hung and died on that cross for you and me. There is no yeah. under, other individual in history that has made more impact on the world. His was an absolutely perfect legacy. There are many other a examples throughout history where people show how much they love God and love the people that God put in their way. About a century after Jesus lived, Christians were being persecuted in Rome by the Romans. A plague went through Rome. Then a century later, after Jesus had been dead about a century, another plague come along. This is a life-changing event for a lot of people. It was recorded in history that in Rome, where about a million people lived, as many as 5,000 people a day were dying per day. There was no cure, and the bodies just rotted in the street. Uh, the COVID's nothing like this, right? If you lived in one of the villages and somebody came up with the symptoms, what would you do? You'd leave. Leave the sick behind. But guess who did not leave? the Christians. They stayed and fed the sick, changed the bandages, and loved all of those sick well or otherwise. Yes, some of the Christians did get sick. Some of them died. But who knows how many lives they saved, not only physically but spiritually, because the Christians did not flee. The Christians, in the middle of this devastating circumstance, loved the people that God put in their path. Jesus would not have left the sick to fend for themselves. Jesus would not have ignored those people. Jesus would have stayed. He would have loved them. So those Christians did what Jesus would have done, and they left a legacy. People all over the world were stunned by the difference that Christian people had made. They could not understand, but it is written in the history of the Roman Empire that dramatic changes occurred People could not ignore the fact and the actions that the Christians who loved God were so completely in love with the people around them that they were willing to give up their lives in the service of God. When the world sees Christians' love in action, the lost can be saved, believe me. People do not get saved by bullying or legislation. They get saved when they see the light of Jesus shining in your eyes and my eyes and they hear the truth. Those who show the love of Christ through their daily actions will leave a legacy that lasts. One that you all know, Mother Teresa. Remember her? She had no money. Her devotion to God was poured out on a daily basis in such passion that she could hardly grasp it, that we could hardly grasp it. Think of the, legging la the, la the lasting legacy that she left. There are missions all over the world right now devoting their lives and sometimes giving their lives to spread the word of God. But you don't have to go to a foreign country and risk your life or your health and possibly your life to leave a legacy that's pleasing to God. You do not have to do deeds that will make front page news or make you very popular with the people in Hollywood or Chicago or New York or even Kansas City. How many, wasn't there somebody here from Kansas City? Well, that's good. <laughs> God looks for the person that is willing to serve with heart for him. Those are the people that leave a legacy that's pleasing to God. Those are the ones that will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's Matthew 25, 23. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Churches like this one and others who use its resources to, to love the community have a lasting legacy. Are you familiar with the Las Vegas comedy il illusion team called Penn and Teller? Yeah, Any? I don't even know if they're still around. Yeah, Penn was an outs... <laughs> they're what? Okay, Penn was an outs outs outspoken atheist. He posted on his blog 
and his personal website about a man who gave him a Bible after one of his shows. The man approached Penn after the show and said that he was very complimentary about the performance. Then the man handed Penn a Gideon Bible edition of the New Testament, which also includes the book of Psalms. Penn said the man was very kind and looked him straight in the eye when he gave him the Bible. The man had written a note in the front of the Bible and listed his phone number and his email address just in case. Penn's blog is quite lengthy, so I'm not going to go into all of it, but this is what Penn said. Penn said he was very impressed with the kindness of the man and the fact that the man was willing to step out and do what he believed in. Penn used the analogy that if a truck was coming at you and you did not believe it, that man would tackle you and push you out of the way. This man had the conviction that he truly believed and stepped out in faith. Even though receiving the Bible did not push Penn into being a believer, he respected the man for trying to push him into the belief that would lead him to heaven. At the time, Penn wrote in his blog that he was an atheist. The last words he wrote was, I still think that religion does a lot of bad stuff. But man, that was really a good guy who gave me that book. That's all I want to say. That's all Penn said. You never know, though, when Penn's heart might change. And he might pick up that Gideon Bible. And he might find his way to Jesus. Jesus, there, in, excuse me, in Jesus' time, there were two schools of thought concerning a commandment about loving your neighbor. One group thought that they should keep the commandment of not working on the Sabbath. That was not allowed or would not allow them to help someone in need. The other group, that if someone was in need, that took precedence over the fact that they had to take care of that person on the Sabbath and make the Sabbath holy and help could be given. Jesus identified the second group when he said, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus told a parable of a good Samaritan. I'm sure you're mostly familiar with it. There was a Jewish man beaten alongside of the road. A priest passed him by. A temple assistant passed him by. But a despised Samaritan came by and took care of that Jewish man. Which of these three men fulfilled the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself? How often in our daily lives do we fail to love our neighbors as ourselves? How many excuses have we used? I'm too busy. I don't want to get involved. I don't really know that person. I don't know what to say. I'm sure you can think of a lots of excuses to do what we should be doing. Jesus was constantly criticized for befriending people that those individuals would stay were less desirable. Prostitutes, tax collectors, beggars, cripples. Jesus loved everybody. He did not hate those who nailed him to the cross. He even said to God the Father, forgive them who executed me. Jesus said, I don't know if you can get this one up or not. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's Luke 23, 34. If you were nailed to a cross, would you be able to do that? Would you believe? I mean, we're not all, we're not going to be Jesus, that's for sure. But I want to be with Jesus because he has all the things that I need for eternity. Love, life, happiness, sharing. Now, I'm sure most of you have been to some funerals. You know, when fa families and friends gathered about a deceased person's casket or urine, what do they talk about? Do they talk about how much money the person accumulated? Do they talk about the possessions that that person had? Or what position he or she held? Money and possessions are earthly currency. In the end, they'll be gone. Usually the conversation is about the positive things that person did. Stories of caring for others. Stories of the good times they had together. Stories of the kind things that they did for others. 
and the love that flowed from him or her. These are things called heavenly currency. In the end, these are what you will never lose. They're, those are the actions that show we love God and love our neighbor. These are the actions that build a legacy. There's an old joke about a man who left a note giving instruction to what would happen when he took, when he took place and died. He wanted all of his assets to be liquidated, put in cash, and stuffed in the coffin with him. <laughs> his coffin would be lined with money. But that's not what his wife had in mind. She had a different plan. She took out the cash, wrote a check, slipped it in his pocket. <laughs> well, she said, my check's good anywhere. <laughs> oh, it's kind of funny when you think about it. We do know where that man's treasure was. I don't think he was thinking about his heavenly treasure. By the way, have you ever seen a U-Haul behind a hearse as it's on its way to the cemetery? Never have, have you? <laughs> yeah, put your motorcycle on, take it, to, take it to, well, that won't work either. Sure, we all like our possessions, do, but, do we, but are they our primary concern in life? We need to reconsider our heavenly treasure. Everything on this earth is temporary. I'm going to give you two interesting stories by Jonathan Kahn. Has anybody read any of his oh, books? Yeah. This guy is great. Jonathan Kahn, who is a writer of Christian books, compared each stage of his life or your life as a tent. Those tents are just temporary places that we travel through on our way to the promised land. So we need to keep our heart fixed on our heavenly home. One of the last parables of Matthew is the story about the sheep and the goats. I'm sure you know this one. Those who were the goats received no reward. Those who were the sheep received a reward. According to the parable, the deciding factor was whether they loved each other, they had fed the hungry, had given a drink to the thirsty, had they clothed those who needed clothing, had they ministered to the sick. Those who loved the neighbors were sheep. They followed Jesus' voice to do what he does, to love the neighbor. That is a Christ-like legacy we all should strive for. I don't know about you. This is not in my stuff here. I have a struggle every day, every day of my life. Should I or should I not do this or do that? I'm not talking about fun stuff like you know, going out and sinning or anything like that. Uh, I'm too old to sin. Uh. <laughs> but I am thinking every day about the put footprints that I have and will they or will they not be washed away? My footprints in life. You know, this is rather difficult to do on your own. We cannot love God and our neighbor just because of the law. As Pastor Steve has told us many times, the law is good, but it was there just to give us a way to show how short we fall of the reality of God. It is impossible to keep the law on your own. We must accept Christ's offer of mercy. We must understand and accept that what he did on the cross was for each of us, and we should be filled with his Holy Spirit. Then we'll be empowered to love God and love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Now, there's a difference between loving yourself and having this big ego out here that I am great. There's nothing that I do that is worthwhile that God has not said, I will make sure that you can do it. There's nothing that you can do that is good that God is not behind you. There's nothing that you can do that is bad that the guy with the horns isn't behind you. So be a thorn in the devil's side like I'm trying to be and say today is the first day of the rest of my life and I am going to be good to my neighbors. Through our actions as non-believers, excuse me, through our actions as believers, people are drawn to us through Christ. Uh, this book, the book of mysteries, one of the first things I'm going to tell you in this mystery is the mystery of two waters. Maybe you've heard this. The Sea of Galilee receives its water on the north end 
from the inflow of the Jordan River. When the water inflows, outflows, excuse me, at the other end, it becomes the Jordan River again and flows southward to the Sea of Salt, which is called the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea, there is virtually nothing alive, even though it gets its water from the same river that the Sea of Galilee does. So got the picture, Jordan River, then the Sea of Galilee, then the Jordan River, then the Dead Sea. One sea, the Sea of Galilee, is alive with fish and vegetation. The other one, the Dead Sea, has no vegetation. Here is the puzzlement. There is one fact missing. The water stays in one place in the Dead Sea. It receives, but it never gives. And the water becomes dead. So what does that teach us? The life that gives of what it receives and blesses others is alive. The life that takes and doesn't give becomes dead. These two seas receive the same water from the same source. We as humans receive our blessings, all of us, from the same source, our Heavenly Father. You can be a living sea or you can be a dead sea. Either one will be part of the legacy you leave on this earth. One more illustration here that I thought was very good. It's called the reflection in the pool. When you smile in the water, the person smiling looks back at you and smiles. When you frown, the person in the water frowns back at you. When you stretch out your hand as if to give something, the hand stretches out to give something back. When you stretch out your hand to take something, the hand reaches out to take it back from you. This is the law of reflection. As you do, so it will be done to you. If you bless others, you will be blessed. If you withhold blessings, blessings will be withheld. If you live by taking, it will in the end be taken from you. If you live a life of giving, it will in the end be given to you. Condemn others and you will be condemned. Forgive others and you will be forgiven. Life with a closed hand and his hand will be closed to you. What you give will be taken back. What you take will be taken back. Therefore, love everybody of giving, of blessing, of compassion, and an open heart. Live your life like you're viewing the face in the water, which is a reflection of you. I hope my message today gives you some ideas to think about for the rest of your life and your legacy. All of us someday are going to face that final <coughs> curse. And now, now you people who are musicians know this. And you can say, as the song goes, I did it my way. Remember that? I changed one word in that for me. I say, as the Bible goes, I say, I did it his way. Let's close our eyes and give a little prayer for those who are not here with us, uh, who are on their way to wherever, hopefully upward. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us this opportunity to share this time together. We gather here in your glorious name. Thank you for your faithful love, and we ask that you help us so we can show a greater love for others. We are also grateful for the gift that you gave us, your son, Jesus Christ. During this Easter season, help us to remember that it is not about colored eggs and chocolate bunnies. Help us to remember that your son, Jesus, gave his life so that we may have everlasting life. Help us to live as close to you and share the message of our belief with our family and neighbors. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Stand in awe.